Welcome, welcome everybody to LAPPG Presents, exploring the restoration of Francis Ford Coppola's work. We're gonna have a conversation with James McCaskey tonight, uh, film archivist and restoration supervisor for American, American Zoetrope. And we have Jay, uh, Jay Holbin here to moderate, which is fantastic. For those of you who don't know, he's a director, producer, and associate member of the AFC and a technical editor for American Cinematographer. And he, his most recent book is the uh, Cine Lens Manual, which is an 800-page book that is sure to be an industry Bible. Um, I, talked, I just talked to Jay for a minute, and we realized he did, he did it over eight years, so it was about 100 pages a year. And I'll tell you, that is a lot of content. So welcome, Jay. I really thank you for taking the time being to be here with us. It means a lot. I know you're a super busy guy. I heard about all the projects you have your hands in. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Wendy. It's an absolute honor to be here. And I'm super happy uh, to be here with the LAPPG. So uh, Wendy already gave the, the main introduction to James. James, come on in and join us. Uh, James McCoskey is the archivist and restoration supervisor for Francis Ford Coppola's American Zoetrope. <clears throat> and uh, your work includes The Outsiders, Cotton Club, Apocalypse Now, and of course, the three Godfather films. And you're right now in the Bologna Film Festival screening Godfather 1, 2, and 3, right? Yeah, well, thank you, Jay, and thank you for having me, and thank you to the LAPDG to uh, put this together, and it's a, it's a fun, uh, it's midnight here, so hopefully I, I won't drift off, so you have to ask some good questions later on, and look forward to that. Um, we, yeah, we're here at, for Godfather 1 and 2, but mainly for 3, here in Italy, it didn't get really a chance during COVID to, to come out, and the festival really wanted to get it out here, and it's a great, great spot, because when we showed Apocalypse Now, we had 10,000 people, and there's nowhere I think of that could have that many people outdoor uh, and, and watching a great old film. So it's a great place to see old classic films. Well, that's extraordinary. I can't imagine having 10,000 people to see a film. Well, I was just talking to someone the other day. It was in New York. It's hard to find theaters 200, 300 screens. So if you want to do an event like Apocalypse Now, uh, it's really hard to find a theater in New York or LA that can house that amount of people. You know, over a thousand it gets tough finding a theater anymore. Yeah, for sure. Especially since COVID, nobody wants to be that crowded. It's hard. It's hard. I have hearing a lot of people in New York. It's hard to get people back in the theaters. So, but here we had a, we had we had six thousand people to see a silent film, a nineteen twenty six silent film. So, you know, I hopefully that's a good sign to come, and it will the tide will come in bringing people back to the theaters in the United States. Well, that's actually a great segue when we talk about silent film and being able to still watch silent films in today's day and age. Let's talk a little bit about your background and how you got into film restoration and film preservation. Well, um, I was uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz, California, and uh, always you know, I fell in love with the history of Santa Cruz where they had you know, Hollywood could have been anywhere in the silent era. It could have been in Santa Barbara. It could have been in Ithaca, New York. Uh, it, what had land really into Hollywood until like the late teens, early 20s, it was always here in the beginning, but people were experimenting everywhere. And Santa Cruz was one of those places that had a great, you know, Mary Pickford came up, D.W. Griffith, all the main top people of the silent era. So it had this long history of silence. So I became very much interested in the history. I knew production was not necessarily my thing. You know, those are special people who can do production. You know, those are Francis people. And I was more on the historical side. And uh, I thought, you know, it would be nice to do history uh, in, 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 in some way. And I found out there was a, a course in the, in, in the UK that taught uh, about film archiving. And I studied there and came back to the States, worked for UCLA for a little bit. Then I said, you know, I don't really want to be in LA all that much, but uh, you know, but I want film, of course, that make, doesn't make sense. <laughs> but I, re I, I remembered, oh, I saw Apocalypse Now Redux at the Wilshire in, in LA uh, for Redux uh, in 2000. I said, ah, oh, Francis has a studio up there. I wonder, he must have needed an archivist. So I wrote him a letter and he interviewed me, brought me up to San Francisco and said, you know, we're going to start one from the heart. We're going to start Outsiders. And a redux was really, really challenging to, to restore us. One of, at that time, you know, three million feet of film. It was 
so many things that they shot and uh it was so difficult to actually go through that collection and find what they need to add the 45 minutes back into apocalypse now uh so they didn't want to have that trouble and so it was very it was a very good timing that's fantastic so you probably went out to the vineyard and got a chance to have some wine with francis and he said come on board yeah, it was a crazy day. I drove I drove up from L.A. Uh, at San Francisco, had lunch. I didn't have a thing. I was being interviewed during lunch. Uh, and then they said, OK, lunch is over. Why didn't you drive up to Napa <laughs> and see the collection? So it was a very long day and then go back down to L.A. So, but, uh, you know, it must, it must something must have happened, right? Because <laughs> I've been here 20 years. Well, congratulations for that. Obviously, uh, film preservation is something that is extraordinarily important. It's part of the heritage, part of history. Uh, if you can take a moment to proselytize to our current industry uh, about the importance of preservation or uh, about the maybe problems of digital origination. Um, yeah, you know, I, it, it, I, we, we have this conversation uh here every day it's it's uh you know it's one thing that talked about the industry with professionals who sort of have an understanding about how fragile the medium is but to introduce actually ordinary with the general public that you know we almost lost godfather with the so much damage that was done in 1972 on through the uh 50 years worth of history uh that negative could have been lost uh and, and it just reminds everywhere that some wonderful classics are on the edge of uh, being obliterated. And so we have to constantly remind people that the images that we shoot, the images that we take uh, as a very important to us as, as artists, that we are their caretakers. And a digital medium is, is very fragile, even more fragile than, than uh, film. I can, you know, properly kept, uh, I can keep film for thousands of years. I can retard the, the, the d deterioration uh, with the right temperature, but a hard drive goes down. And as we know, can we got be gone? We, I, we hear that story about Toy Story, where uh, the film was almost lost because uh, they wiped the backups didn't uh, work that day. And but luckily, uh, someone at home had backed it up on their computer and saved the entire film. So those are the scary things, you know, how close we even lost Toy Story, and that's not that old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I was kind of planning on holding off on the super geeky stuff, but I can't. I, I just want to dive in. So I, I think The Godfather, uh, talking about that and the, and the possibility that we might have lost that, uh, leads me into asking, let, let, let's talk about Godfather a bit and about what elements you had to go to and what you had to find in order to do this restoration. Well, first off, you have to though we have to acknowledge Paramount. They're they own the film, and they're the caretakers. They're the ones that have been really spearheading the uh, the the archival and the preservation of that material. And we were fortunate that Andrea Callis and the team over at, uh, at Paramount wanted to work with us. You know, a little bit of uh, you know, if anything came out of COVID that was actually positive, is that we actually were able to spend more time on on this material and and, and work with them. And uh, when labs were down, we were able to continue working on it to, to make the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Paramount is, uh, I, I don't want to take credit away from that because they, they really are the ones that stepped up. So I, and I, I diverted. So to ask that question one more time. Basically, where where did you have to go to get these elements and where were you hunting oh, them down? And, and well, it, starts, it starts with detective work. It starts with detective work because you get, you got Jeffrey Osner, you got Chuck uh, Woodfill, who are the Paramount archivists, uh, the vault manager down there, and they're going through the line script and they're finding every shot and they're trying to get the codes for the films and make, and they go back to the vault and try to open up every single can. You know, in, in 2007 uh, was the first digital restoration and people always come to me and say, why are you restoring the Godfather? Hasn't it been restored? Well, you know, it, it, we there was a photochemical restoration in 1997 that pretty much the last, uh, the first 20 minutes of the film was completely removed with Duke negative because it was destroyed. So you got about the first 10 minutes, which was still kind of a patchwork of material, but the last 10, 10 minutes were completely removed and replaced. So where did that stuff go? And Robert Harris was the one that sort of got that team together with Gordy Willis to, to open up everything and figure out how, what they could find. Some things they couldn't repair, some things they had to go with uh, inferior elements. Uh, but you would think, okay, he, he did it all. 
No, there was still a lot of stuff missing at that time. And so Paramount decided to go back and open up everything. Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Godfather 3, the network version that they did. Uh, so things were misplaced and labels fell off. And they were able, with the detective work and time, actually find a little bit more. So, you know, Bob got, got us to maybe 98%. Now we're at 99% for almost original negative, you know. But it's still, it's still a very fragile negative and still a patchwork of various sources. So was that original camera negative cut for these other versions, like the television version, and it was sliced up and, and broken? Uh, uh, in, in some cases, it was. No, but... For, for one, Godfather 1, it was interesting because, you know, the, that was around the time, the end of Technicolor prints uh, in theaters. Uh, the plant closed in 1974. 1972, they made the negative conform, not in A, B rolls, uh, like checkerboarding, where they can go from one fade, fade down, and then fade up from another reel or dissolve or between two reels to preserve our original negative instead of using a dupe negative that uh, downgrades the material. Uh, so that the negative was conformed in a way that was only really good for Technicolor printing. But when Technicolor closed, it was really difficult to find a lab that had the experience to work with that negative. So then they said they cut it, they removed that. Uh, and conformed it to AD reels over the years to do that. And when you do that, then you lost all the timings of the fade and the dissolves, and you have to rebuild all that. Some of the negative was cut during that time. So it, it was a very, that auto select part, the IB tech is part process is a very, very hard uh, on the elements because it has to rewind forward. And this is very, you know, fast. Rip to, uh, the elements were tearing, they're ripping apart, there's no perforation. So it was a very brutal, brutal process to do to your original negative. So long-winded long <laughs> answer to your question. That's why we're here, man. So the long-winded answers are better. Less of me, more of you. That's what, that's what it's about. So you tried to get as much of the original camera negative as possible into this restoration. Where were... Very important because you know you don't want to you, you want to maintain the look. It's hard when you go from original negative to dupe negative to uh, YCMs to CRI. It starts looking different from shot to shot. So you want it to unify that original negative. Were there certain sequences that that wasn't possible, and you had to go to other elements? The wedding scene, the uh, ten minutes in to real one, uh, that starts the breaking uh, breaking down. Uh, that had been removed, but you had Kay and Michael are talking at the wedding, talking about Luca Brazzi and how that how, how that relationship started. Uh, Johnny Fontaine singing to uh, 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 Talia Shire, and uh, that, that all that material is a collage. It's a patchwork of various material. Yeah, that was probably the most damaged of the of the film. And also, I would say the restaurant scene when Michael comes and has his moment that he assumes the Godfather. And, becomes part of the family, you know, sits down with, with, uh, it's a lot. So, uh, and, uh, that, that scene was also very, very challenging, uh, part of the film to, to restore. I think that's a great segue. Let's, you gave us some examples here of, uh, before and after, uh, that we can look at. And I think the first one that we should look at is the wedding sequence, uh, since we just kind of brought that up to get an example of some of the work that was done, the, the original work and what the restoration looks like. And James, you can just talk us through this. So this is a show a little bit about how far we've come from 2007. You know, again, a restoration that was not done too long ago. And it was a very foundational piece of work that Bob did. So what more could we improve? Well, you could see that there was still dupe, uh, dupe negative. But 13, 14 years later, we finally found that piece of camera negative that we can reunite with the film. And this shows with the color negative without the color. The 2000 shows the 2000 color. Uh, so that's why it's kind of milky on the right. But here you go. And now today, what you can't really see is the details a little bit in the zoom. So that's a little bit lost. But you see more of the details in the boards, the background. The color uh, is, is not quite. Uh, it's hard to judge color. Oh, there it goes. It freezes. 
Uh, see, it's kind of more on the red. Uh, the other one's kind of more neutral, but it, yellow. This was also a very important scene for Gordy because it has to look like that home video, like you shot this home video at the wedding. So we had to maintain that, keep, keep that look. But uh, this also shows its problems is that the way they monitored back back in 2000 changed. You monitor on, on, on a different monitor. So it, uh, the thing changes just slightly in looks, but it keeps the original intent intact. There was an interesting uh, thought that came into my head uh, between fighting against nostalgia and what people are used to seeing and fighting against what is it's supposed to look like. Yes. How much? Yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question because I, we fight with this all every day, you know, and I, I think luckily I have Francis in the room. You know, uh, it's, it's a shame not to have Gordy uh, with us, but we do have his his work that he did with Bob Harris in, in 2007. That is that is our guy. Uh, unfortunately, and what Gordy and Bob found out was there was no reference print. We have no great uh, color, uh, reference for for the look of Godfather one and two. We think how how could that be? But all those prints were used. Uh, those IV tech prints just don't exist. Other than two prints that we found at the Academy, uh, Michael Pogazowski uh, at uh, Ampis uh, showed it to us, and the same thing that he showed to to Gordy and, and Francis. But you no, know, Godfather Two wasn't a reference print. We we're like, it could have been an NG print. It was not a good print. It was probably something that a film collector got taught when it was tossed out of the lab. It, it just didn't feel right. So Gordy was sort of, you know, back in two thousand, kind of having to rework that because. His, his original temp was lost. Godfather 1 wasn't bad. Uh, we did have a fairly decent, but it wasn't spot on, um, as we had hoped. So, again, Gordy stepped in to, to really hold the hand there and, 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 and try to dial it back to what it was. So, but it, it is amazing to think, that, again, how, how could it be that after almost 50 years that we, we don't have any original prints on the Godfather? And that just shows you how much it was loved. <laughs> how much it was shown in circulation, you know. Also, just, the, the, I, I think the general impression is, well, you just, you go back to the original camera and, and scan that and it, it's fine. But it's not. It's really, like you said, it's a lot more of a detective work to put all of these components together uh, to do these restorations, even though it had been done uh, a little over a decade ago. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think if you see some of the the other clips that, uh, the stabilization, these films were shrunk, uh, the film shrinks, the perforations tear, you get a jitter from all that damage and it sells out. Well, in, in 2007, the technology got it to a certain point, but it still <laughs> wasn't perfect. And there are certain things that we, we wanted to, to raise the bar on. And so cleaning and, and the stabilization, we, we really uh, think that the software came uh, is much more powerful than it was in 2007. It doesn't think it's that long ago, but we made leaps and bounds. And in scanning technology, the scanners are far more gentler uh, this time around. And, and uh, getting in getting for the HDR transfer in 16 bit color. So uh, I, I, it, it showed on that level, the reason why we, we came back to it again for the 50th anniversary. Okay, so you, you actually segued into another topic that I wanted to get into, uh, which is how do you handle an HDR transfer from a technology that was never intended to be presented HDR? That was never uh, Gordy's idea. It was never Francis's idea. How do you do that now? Good question. That's one reason why I'm at Bologna, because uh, all the archivists are here and they're judging that too. What's it appropriate for classic films and, and uh, how do you do it? And my, my take on it, you know, I have Francis, you know, we did Tucker for the very first time in HDR in 2016. And he looked at it side by side to what we did, the Rec 709, way, way back when. And then uh, we had the HDR version. He said it looked like a, a veil had been lifted over the camera lens. You know, and it just shows what more detail. This is not, we're not adding anything. You know, this is what was actually captured in the original negative. And, you know, uh, we restore it, but we, Francis would like to, to explore different presentations. You know, people are used 
to films looking at the way they do in theaters. And there's a certain expectation. And the worst thing we, we, we can do when we're trying to find a new Oz is make it like it's an old film uh, and, and it doesn't look to what, what they want. You know, hope the story comes out, but a lot of people say, oh, it's an old film, it's scratched. You know, that silent film is, it's scratched, it's torn, it's, it's not color, it's black and white, it's silent, there's no, you know. And that, that's not true, you know, th those, those films and the proper presentation are, hand tone uh tinted and toned uh they were uh, had a beautiful score usually written for it uh so uh, but you know over time they lost that during during restorations or or when they made a copy you know it was just cheaper to make a black and white print and so people had a negative opinion about silent films so you have to re-educate people and i think that it is also helpful to explore and francis always loves this with apocalypse we did dolby atmos for apocalypse because it felt right having the helicopters go over above you that made made wonderful sense if any classic film uh could use dolby atmos Apocalypse now gave it, and I said, uh, it gave it a, a good, good presentation. And uh, same with the HDR colors, like the Dulong bridge sequence is so beautiful in HDR, where you got these beautiful blacks, these inky, inky blacks, and then you have these neon flares shining. That that's where HDR shines, are those little moments where the flares just flicker off, you know. Um, and that that I think. Wow, people again. So we go back to and say, like, "Well, this is a really good film, even though it's it's from 1979. It looks like it was shot yesterday." And so we hope, you know, uh, I do one foot in the past because I know we have fans and they love. The, we 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 don't want to ever sort of ruin that experience of what made it special to them. You know, as you said earlier, that people have strong opinions. They they have an idea of the, how the, the the presentation was for them. And we, of course, we can't replicate every single presentation, but I think that we are also trying to push the technology, use the technology, which Francis has always been on sort of that leading edge of technology uh, and, and use it as a way to try to uh, re, uh, get a new audience. And so hopefully in 50 years that people are still watching the film. And that's a, that's a great point too. I mean, now obviously you're going into a digital master, you're creating a brand new HDR digital negative, uh, what is the best way to archive that for the next 20 years or 30 years and to make sure that that stays? That's the best solution is uh, duplication. Redundancy is always our mantra. You know, have many, many copies. Uh, LTO really is the only thing right now that's been good, good uh, source for, for preservation storage, digital preservation and storage is LTO. Uh, that has its challenges. It's not perfect, but it can store a lot of data cheaply. Uh, hard drives, as again, <laughs> uh, prone to error and, and, and failure. So uh, that's the least desirable. So we're we're in a very precarious state, you know. And the, so if you make an LTO, we try to make like three copies of it, you know, and store it in various uh, places. So they're not in the same place and, and, and all. But it is a scary thing because you, you couldn't do that necessarily with, with film. I couldn't copy that. You would, again, m make a, a copy and it's not it's not the original negative. It's something different. Uh, and, but that would have been expensive to make all this. Making the YCMs, pres the preservation masters on, on, on separations, those were a very expensive process. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, in, in some ways, digital is, it can be, um, seem cheap, but is also just as expensive as having real estate in storing the, the uh, actual physical elements. And LTO, you almost have to also archive the tape with the, the, the reader, because in a couple generations... It was sold in the original. <laughs> Remember, we got our first LTO three, and it was supposed to be backwards compatible. And then they that started changing, <laughs> sort of a bait and switch. But uh, so that was always uh, that was the and not only just uh, the, the so, yeah, software as you had retrospect at that time, uh, but it, now we have tar and, and that all of it. All of it's kind of flaky. I, I, we, we do use LTFS, and that's been knock on wood, sort of stable, and hopefully last we just need something to last <laughs> because we have been 10 15 years the hardware changes you have to keep everything with the computer the deck that ran that lto the software that version that's that's way too complicated the film storing film was far easier <laughs> than, than storing digital files and and people ought to be astounded by that you know that that wasn't it seems like digitally scan it in and it should last forever but 
it's it's more headache and it's also you know it's out of sight it's on a hard drive it's easier to forget things or what's this hard drive i'm storing this hard drive here it's it means nothing to me but a film you know sitting sitting on a shelf uh you know, you can at least visualize the importance of, <laughs> in, uh, of that material. Did you create YCM Separation Masters from this digital? Not, not, no, they can be output to film. And uh, you know what um, uh, Paramount has protected with a rig new original negative, though. They have made a scan out on Nick, uh, Nick, so it is preserved on film. That's fantastic. Oh, yes. So we kind of bounced around in a couple ideas there because it once you throw something out of me, and you got you got me at midnight bring, so I'm gonna go all over. That's all right. I'm gonna try to drive us back, drive the train back on the tracks. And you had mentioned a, an extraordinarily seminal scene in Godfather, which is Michael in the restaurant, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's also another great example of the work that was done to restore uh, this current version. This was tricky too because this was this was also a collage of various you have know, a YCM separation. And this is again we found negative uh, Jeff, uh, Osmer and would uh, found the material here and up, was able to upgrade the sequence. It's hard to see sort of the resolution. Everything's kind of chunky and, uh, but uh, hopefully you get to see a little bit, get more of a neutral. The other thing is that like all these various elements put together make for a, diff a challenging time to color grade because they all have their own kind of different slight color characteristics. Yeah, that's something that's really fascinating to me. You know, in, in my personal memory, it does have a little bit more of that yellow tone, probably because I, I grew up with it, you know, on VHS and, and, and really compromise uh, formats. The more neutral tone that you went with the 2022 has a beautiful look to it. But again, it, it's somewhat dangerous with that nostalgia, right? Uh, hey, wait, we didn't hit it as hard. I don't know, the Paramount Yon didn't because, again, that was a monitoring, the difference in monitoring at that time. Also, the various, using different elements here for, for this uh, process that, um, you know, uh, that, that sort of gave them to just not hit it as hard, you know, still, still in the, the neighborhood and still trying to be very respectful to, to where, what they had worked on in 2007. And of course here you, you have Francis sitting with you, right? I mean, he's pretty much by yeah. your side in this process. So you have the main artist with you making these decisions. Well, uh, Francis is always very much, you know, Gordy. Gordy was the the one that wrote the rule book of how how it looked, and he did, was very, very much wanting to pay tribute. And uh, so, you know, knowing that things were slightly different, we hope that Gordy uh, is looking down and appreciative of what what was done. You know, it is it is still you know twenty twenty two new technology, new monitors, and how we're watching this film. So there is going to be a slightly different presentation, but I hope in the end that he would also uh, bless this as well. Is there any kind of guide that you could give to the viewing audience about how to see the best variation and the best version of these restorations? Uh, what monitoring system I use at home and what we did in LA. The sure. best thing we, we used was, a uh, not to make a plug for LG, but what we liked about LG, the C10, especially during COVID. And we, we started using that monitor because it was hard to get, you know, Francis down to a lab uh, and flying down during the height of COVID. So we had to have a method to get comments back while the colorist was working. I mean, Warners and MPI were shut down. Uh, they, they couldn't have people in the, in the room. So we had to figure out a way to, to, to make it work for us. And uh, we had the C10 side by side with the Sony uh, X300 uh, uh, HDR monitor and with the CX. And we could see, you know, the slight variations, but we could report back to them. Okay, it's probably, you know, leaning a little this way, but 
that's that's how it's translating. So we could give them a little bit of feedback, but pretty much that's E10 was dialed into to the the professional monitor down in in LA at MPI. So. So we all need so to go out and get the LG. And you can have them. That's what I have personally. And uh, when I watched the films, it's like, yeah, that's that's what I was looking at the lab. And I, that's a, that's the most rewarding because, you know, most people are going to see the film that way. And I would want them to have that same experience. And it's very rare to have that experience over the home video uh, lifetime, you know, the last 40, 50 years of home video. Uh, the lab reference will never look like that at the end product. And people are always saying, it looks like shit. You know, it's like, of course, they won't blame themselves. They got their TV and that cranked up because uh, I'm sure my, my mother had her TV wrong. But it, I, she was sure that the studio was, was, was wrong. <laughs> Not her. Of course, so, of course. But I feel those, those major differences are slighter and slighter these days. You know, so I feel that what we're getting out of the lab, I'm very proud of for just watching it at home. And I hope that people feel the same way. Well, that's one of the extraordinary things about HDR is that we now at home have an experience that can actually get incredibly close to what the artist's intention is, as opposed to this massive compromise that we've always had with NTSC and 709 and, and all, of, all this other crap okay. we've been dealing with. Talking with uh, Stephen Burrow about pan and scan, it was like he cringed cringe going into the lab because he knew that you know he had a beautiful scope uh, film with outsiders and he had to cut the slides off or or reposition. He, he that's why he chose uh, scope for for outsiders. It's it's interesting. It's a beautiful film to do it, but no one realizes you know why he he chose scope is to get all four characters all in one shot. And scope was really well, so you get these very intimate shots with all four characters all on the screen, and um, you know, and then doing that with pan and scan, you know, you got got Pony Boy over here, and then I have to scan over, to, and the conversation bounces forward. And it's like, oh. so we've come a long way from, from there. So, and I feel that DPs, and I hope, uh, and Francis for cert certain is like, you know, we 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 are having less and less compromises in the home video era. For sure, for sure. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to touch on, because it was a real surprise to me that I didn't know VistaVision was used on Godfather. You've got a sequence here, the Vegas sequence, where you have VistaVision um, yes. elements. Yes, they found stock footage. They originally had stock footage back in uh, 1972 uh, 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 that they located uh, uh, of Las Vegas, and they incorporated it into the optical of of uh, Michael going to to Las Vegas. But it's beautiful stuff. Uh, and going back to having Paramount find in the can the original negative that they used for for that shot was was great to be able to incorporate that. Got it. So that wasn't what the production shot. That was stock footage that was used. It was stock footage, yeah. So fascinating. Yeah, I want to touch a little bit on Godfather Three because it's a it's a film that gets a little bit of a bad rap. Uh, but I know that you guys are working on or have done a, a restoration and a recut of the film, right? Well, every I think every Francis always uh, has a bad rap after his last film. You know, he's always judged by the last film. Apocalypse now within Godfather. You know, and, and that was a very challenging, difficult, economical disaster for, for him, you know, and it wasn't successful, he would say, at, at that time. It took people to, over a few years, uh, 10 years, 15 years, to really come to it and appreciate it. Uh, one from the heart was judged against the apocalypse. And that's not, you know, that's, for Francis, he's not making the same film every time. It was not interesting to, to him. And uh, so for Godfather 3, he, it, it wasn't one and two. But people wanted one and two, and, and that was that was and, and that was not interesting to Francis. You know, he didn't want to make Godfather, but he did, and he made it his own. He found a way to do it, and he's like, "I'm not going to do." Uh, if they ask me to do Godfather, no. Nah. But he was able to say, "Okay, well, if you really want me to do it, I have to do it this way," and they gave him that freedom, and he changed it. Got, Godfather two is completely different style than, than than one, and three for him was like, "Okay." If you really, really want me, I don't want to do it, but I'll, 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 I'll take a shot, but I want to try it in, in also a different way. And Coda for him is the summing up of, uh, of what one and two was, was about and to come up with a proper con uh, conclusion that he wants and, you know, revisit it. And I hope that after 
you know, we are 30 years into it that people do think, hey, you know, uh, it's now sitting afterwards. But I didn't have that first visceral reaction when I was sitting. I was like, well, what am I watching? You know, this is not Godfather 2. This is not what I'm used to watching with my family. You know, so uh, hopefully people can sit back and cool and watch it and, and appreciate it for its for its, a film on its own, you know. Apocalypse is, is another obviously extraordinarily seminal film from Francis. Uh, if we want to touch a little bit on that before we dive into some questions here, uh, the process of the restoration of that film. With Apocalypse, uh, that one, I started in 2017. We got it out for 2019 uh, for the 40th anniversary. And that one was rather difficult because uh, they had cut the negative for to be redux. And so the original version we had to, to, to restore as well. So we restored Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now Redux. And then we had, after all, doing a restoration, Francis always comes up with the idea, well, let's create the version that I really want to do. And that's how, that's also Godfather 3 and Code came about. You know, this, this is what I really wanted to do. Uh, and with anything, he was always rushed for time and, and, or he was conscious that people may not have understood. He thought, they thought people, uh, at the time thought it was weird and wacky and came out of the left field. And so he said, well, maybe Redux can uh, be, be after 30 years, people can let, let it uh, appreciate a new version of it. And then Final Cut comes out to say, okay, it's the Goldilocks. It's not, it's not Apocalypse, the 79 version. It's not Redux, but somewhere in the middle. It takes a little bit of what 79 was and what Redux was and come up with this sort of Goldilocks uh, version. You know, which, which he was proud. So yeah, that was what is always fun with Francis is that you know we've appreciated where the past and the fa film fans loved the the earlier versions, but he's always thinking, okay, well, as with any good story, it changes over time. You can tell the same story in a slightly different way, and maybe an audience that day can can see it in a different light. I think for film audiences, uh, I think they're open to that as long as they can still get the original version as well. There isn't a destruction of that when there is a, a new vision. Well, I think with you see with all the versions that we have done on Outsiders, we did Outsiders, the complete novel, Apocalypse, uh, One from the Heart in, in some ways too, that we've always had that. The film fans want that. And we, we have always understood that, you know, they are the ones that made the film <laughs> uh, important and significant, you know, in people's lives. And so we, we want to offer that and not forget that, but also, push it into a different direction and try something new. So I want to get to, we've got quite a few questions here. I want to get to some of these coming in. we got some nerdy ones, like which scanner did you use? I'm assuming we're going to talk about... Uh, director's 4K scanner. I stepped on you there. Try that again. It was a director's 4K scanner by Laser Graphics. Oh, simple enough. Um, and... What other hardware or software did you use? Uh, for cleanup, I use Diamant software. Uh, many labs use various other visual effects tools, but Diamant's geared for restoration. Um, uh, some use a Pixel Logic, a PF Clean, uh, or uh, Smoke, or Phoenix. Uh, but generally, I've been happy with, with Diamant. Uh, other software, I mean, it's, uh, it's based on a PC. We got a little bit of Aja, a little bit, you know, every, everybody has uh, 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 been pitching in to, to helping get, get us. We're not a lab, you know, we're, we're sort of as in the spirit of Zoetro, that we're sort of a group of people in a barn pulling things off the shelf to patch it together. And, uh, and sometimes it fails and sometimes we get some success out of that. So. <laughs> yeah, but there's no cows in the barn, right? Uh, well, there was probably at one time, and there's probably still an odor around, but yes, we, it's usually bats, though, <laughs> we have. Well, as long as they're helpful and they'll pull clips for you, then that's fine. We have a mix up in Napa uh, that we've used for 40 years. We started a mix, a mix facility up in Napa uh, with the Outsiders, and uh, it's up on top of the carriage house. The horses were below and the carriages were below, but there was an attic in this, this barn, the carriage house, and it was always filled with, with uh, bats. They were all in the, the acoustics. <laughs> so we always have to steam clean the car before a mixer comes in. <laughs> so. so Pablo asks, as technology advances at an accelerated pace, 
What do you envision technological improvements will bring in the future? In terms of restoration, probably better technology and handling scratches and dirt. And that's always room for improvement. We're pretty good, but that, that, um, they are experimenting with AI restoration. I'm not sure how that will uh, uh, affect that things, but that's uh, an interesting avenue. I don't know how AI will ever be trained to know what an insect is, and that's supposed to be good, but then, uh, and, and bombs exploding, and that's supposed to be dirt in the film, but it's not dirt on the film, <laughs> you know? So those are gonna be interesting things on how computers are gonna sense that. I think you're still gonna have to be some way a person to, to review those, those things. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I, we have this conversation constantly. It's like, what's beyond 4K? Why don't you do 8K? And it's like, you know, a lot of, a lot of these films that were shot on 35 and how they were, a lot of those do negative, doesn't have more than 4K information. Or maybe even slightly less. It varies uh, on the quality of footage that was cut in the negative. I really think 4K is, is a good result uh, for 35, and it's harder and harder to make that justification on all. I know that's probably controversial with a lot of people, you know, but, you know, looking at things, you see diesel that never anyone has ever seen, and uh, it's hard to justify the expense and the amount of data to, to do that, you know. But uh, yeah. that's what I grab. So, yeah, of course, I want, I, I, my main thing is to make sure I capture all the information from that negative. And if certainly if 8K or beyond, uh, which are large, larger formats, of course, it's necessary. But, you know, so we'll always look at that. But that's also, like you said, uh, in the difference in the elements. If you're dealing with the original camera negative, you might get a little bit more out of it. But if you're dealing with a dupe negative, certainly the detail isn't there. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, the, these are things we grapple with, but I mean, we hope that people, you know, we, we, we care, uh, we, we are fans of it too. And we're trying to make the best decisions for the film and, and hopefully, uh, people see that we, people always get very passionate. You know, I always want to make sure that, you know, we, we do love these films and we don't, we're not there to, <laughs> I went in this business not to kill anyone, but I don't want to kill their film, <laughs> their experience. Um, but, uh, and, and sometimes it can be that personal with, I guess that's the times we live in, but I, I just, uh, you know, why people should see that we're all part, we, we love these films and care about them and trying to make the right decisions. And I'm glad we have Francis, uh, to be there to say, this is, this is the, my, my stamp of what, what my film should look like. David Hilton asks, have you been able to give the same attention to the restoration of sound elements for the films too? Dialogue, atmos, sound effects, musical score, and components, etc. That's a good question, and yes, uh, a lot, of, a lot of things have made my job easier. And the sound has been well taken care of by people like Walter Murch and Richard Beggs, Pete Horner, uh, Colin Guthrie. Uh, these, these are my small team. Jim McKee. I have a very small team of audio technicians. A lot of them. I've been around since the very, uh, uh, I have a small library. We don't have a very big library, and, but I have a lot of people that were connected to the making of these films, and especially with the art uh, sound department who work you know, at, the, at Lucas. Uh, and they're still around there and they still want to contribute and help and make sure. And they, over time, like one from the heart, I, I don't touch that. They, the guys did the best work they could ever do when we did the restoration in 2004. It, that's, that's it. Um, same with what Walter Murch did with the Godfather films in 2008. Uh, so a lot of that stuff is locked. Some ways, in some ways, sound is a little bit easier for me because these people took the hands and, and, and did, did the restoration of the, the sound elements well. Raymond Riley uh, asked the same thing that, that I asked when they asked me to, to do this talk is, where do I go to find these specific versions, especially The Godfather? There's so many versions out there. Where am I going to find the latest yeah. of your work? Um, well, streaming, you should be able, I, I prefer you to get the, the physical disc is probably the best. First, theatrical is always the best experience, but they, the, that run is over. The next best thing is the 4K uh, UHD disc that Paramount just released. Uh, so that it just make sure it's the recent version. I know it's hard because you still have the 2008 version, which 
is a great version in itself. And a lot of people, you know, look at that because that was the last thing Vordy touched, you know, and that and I, I have people that write me and say, I don't know about these restoration. I go back to the original DVD that I have. That's fine. <laughs> you know, whatever you like, that's fine. So I'm not going to discount the, the last. I hope you see our restoration. You can judge for yourself. But, you know, I don't want to take those those away from you. Uh, David asks, are many of Mr. Coppola's films stored in the salt mine under Kansas in some format? Uh, well, uh, that is one, uh, one of many. We have uh, vaults uh, you know, in Hollywood and uh, various places around. Salt mines are one of the places that, that, uh, that was used. Uh, to keep them as a, as a perfect place, uh, an ideal place to keep. And a lot of studios uh, opt to use those places uh, because uh, they're naturally dry and cool. So, uh, and then low, that doesn't take much uh, energy to cool those spaces. So they're a perfect film vaults. How long did it take to do the Godfather restoration? Well, the conversation, the conversation uh, that started uh, another film of ours, but the conversation started back in um, 2017. Uh, Andrea Callas called us and said, you know, we need, we know this film is challenging. We need the time. Uh, so it really started five years ago uh, to, to have that conversation in that time. Francis said, okay, well, uh, well if we're going to do this, then I want to put attention on three and do my version of it. So, uh, I would say it was a five-year process. Uh, Godfather 1, ultimately, was cleaning. It took probably about a year. Same with Godfather 2. was a little bit faster. We worked with um, uh, MPI and another facility to do the cleanup to do it in tandem. So we did everything, clean up and color, in probably about a year's time and another year for Godfather 3. So the nuts, nuts and bolts were probably done in a couple of years. Oh, it's faster than I thought it would be. I well, they could be done faster, uh, and then uh, certainly I have great criterion and and, and Paramount. They they have a team. I'm just one person. Robbie Schaefer, my uh, uh, editor, also will lend a hand and did a lot of the work too. So oh, you know, two people uh, when a lot of the labs have more. So we're slower, uh, but uh, we're hopefully we're, we're we we are giving it more close scrutiny. <laughs> you know, so. And you mentioned the conversation already, but Michael asks, can you share the lineup of what are the films that are planned to be restoration uh, restored in the next couple of years? Well, generally, you know, I have, I have a Twitter account, so I, I will uh, include a lot of what I'm doing on my uh, current project. So you always stay tuned there, and then I'll talk about release dates, or I'll talk about um, uh, the current projects and the problems I have. So there's a dialogue there that people can have. Uh, I'm starting one from the heart right now. I worked uh, on Is Paris Burning, a 1966 film that Francis and Gore Vidal uh, adapted a screenplay based on a very popular no novel of the French Resistance. Uh, and uh, that, that should be coming out soon. Uh, then, then we'll turn on to the 50th anniversary of the conversation. Looking forward to all of that. I think that's... Your work is deeply appreciated. I think it's extraordinarily important, uh, especially for such an important filmmaker such as Francis, uh, to maintain this heritage and, and to continue to to give us the best versions of these 50 years after the fact. So thank you, James, for that. Thank you for your time here. And a good question. I like that. It was enjoyable to actually interact with people uh, and, and uh, have a good conversation because it's not, not something the general public care about. So I appreciate having this dialogue. It's Talk about that. Absolutely. I want to uh, turn this back over to Wendy, who's popping back on here. I, I am. I am. Awesome. Let, let me just get one more question in. Um, what, and I apologize if you already answered this, um, what color grading system do you guys use? Uh, we use Resolve. Okay. I know a lot of our Resolve. members are interested in that. And... Yes. Yeah. I enjoyed, we enjoyed Resolve uh, very well in the company because we could do a lot of the work in-house and then take it to the lab and, you know, we could start visual pre-visualization, yeah, which Francis is always very much, you know, before we could go and releases it anyway, start doing the work in-house. So, and Da Vinci has allowed us to do that. So, as I say, we're trying to spread. So. Awesome. Thank you for that. And also, what is your Twitter handle so people can follow you? It's AZ Film Archivist. 
Okay, great. And uh, Jay, while we're here, where can people get your book? CineLensManual.com. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you guys enough. What an informative, inspiring, and uh, fascinating conversation. I learned a lot, and I know about the process way more than I did. So thank you so much um, to Jay and James. Uh, James, please go to sleep, you poor thing. It's so late where you're at. And be sure to catch up on our past meetings. We um, have a YouTube channel. For those of you who don't know, we have over 70 presentations on it. And right now we just released our Frame IO from camera to cloud workflow demo. Michael Cioni and Sarah Katz were here in May and they did a fantastic demo where we actually saw everything happen in real time. And um, our, our audience was able to participate and make comments on the footage. And it was a really cool session. So check that one out. It just launched a couple days ago. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook and on Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn and use the hashtag LAPPG. We will do our best to follow you. And again, Jay and James, thank you. Thank you to all the LAPPG members and friends who joined us. And we will see you guys next time.